I love what God's doing at Great Lakes Church, and uh, especially as we head into the Christmas season. And uh, you're going to hear some things you probably have heard before, but spoiler alert, you'll hear it again next Christmas as well. Uh, and so the thing about church is the story doesn't change a whole lot. So we're going to keep teaching this, but hopefully today we're going to talk about a few things, uh, maybe in a different perspective than you've heard before. So uh, I'm kind of excited about that. But I do want to kind of give fair warning to everybody who's maybe listening, those of us who are watching as well. Um, what I'm going to say might come across a little offensive, a little harsh, okay? But if you'll let me, let me step on your toes a little bit. I, I promise you, I think it's going to be a pretty good, good opportunity for us, all right? And so if, if you're okay with it, just look at me, say, bring it on, bring it on. Bring it yeah, on. thank you. Some of you are like, mm -mm, no, I'm not doing it, nope. Yeah, all right, just remember you said that. Here, here's what it is. We're in this series, we're talking about unwrapping Christmas. We're talking about what it means to kind of dissect the Christmas story, look at what it means to experience the gift of God in some really new and some fresh ways. And so I was thinking about this process, and I started to think about this in my own life, maybe in the life of my family, and maybe you can relate to this. I think one of the most uh, probably important and number one things that has a way of hijacking Christmas, you ready for it? is gifts. Yeah, some of you are like, oh, amen. This is gonna be a cheap Christmas for me. I like this guy already. I like where his heart is. Some of you are like, if we ever did commute at this church, I would throw juice at you, but we're going, just stick with me just for a second, okay? Hey, here's what it is. I think it's really hard for us to understand what it means um, in our culture and what we talk about when we talk about this idea of gifts, because when we think of Christmas, the, the reality is it's kind of synonymous with gifts, and it's hard to kind of disconnect the things. In fact, last year alone, now granted, it was 2020. We had nothing else to do. We spent $729 billion as a country on Christmas. Isn't that crazy? $729 billion. I think it would be really hard to argue that Christmas has not become synonymous with gifts, right? And so let me just say this from the very beginning. I am not anti-gifts. I'm anti-mandate gifts. Is it too soon for those jokes? Too soon, yeah. Usually we let pandemics pass us before we make fun of them, but yeah. I, I'm not anti-gifts, I'm anti-mandate gifts, okay? So I, I love gifts. I love giving gifts. I love when my kids give me gifts. We, uh, the church that I lead, we give tons of presents away every Christmas to families in need, right? So I'm not talking about anti-gifts, but here's what I want us to kind of uh, appreciate and what we want to understand. If it's not, if we're not intentional, if, if you're not careful, there is always going to be this tendency where we lose sight of the purpose and the meaning of Christmas, and gifts can hijack and become the center of our Christmas, which is why I love the Christmas season. It's why I love Advent. Advent is a season where you have to stop and you get to slow down, you get to pause for a little bit, and you get to kind of refocus your heart on the real meaning and the real purpose of Christmas. And here's one of the nicest things that Advent does. Advent reminds you that it's not your birthday, right? Advent reminds you that it's not your birthday. And I know some of us, that's hard to understand because we love gifts, we love when people give us gifts. We love when we receive gifts. Uh, my daughter, Willow, she's six years old. Uh, she can't comprehend that it's someone else's birthday. And so whenever we say, hey, we're going to go celebrate Violet's birthday, she goes, no, it's not Violet's birthday. It's Willow's birthday. And so we've just stopped fighting it. Willow has about 20 birthdays a year. We buy presents, we buy candles and cakes, all these things so that we can show her how much we love her and we care for her. And it's still, whenever we go to a birthday party, maybe if you had younger kids, you kind of remember what this is like, you have to prepare your child that someone else is gonna be celebrated, right? Somebody else is gonna get gifts, somebody else is gonna be loved on and, and they're not gonna be able to have the gifts. And so every time we go to a party, we always kind of bring Willow to the side and we just say, Hey, Willow, listen, it's not your birthday. You're actually not gonna be able to open the gifts. And this has become such a thing, right? If you ever host a birthday party for young kids, we feel so bad that we're not giving gifts to the other kids to open that we give them parting gifts when they leave, right? And we just go, here, here you go, thanks for coming. Like, you understand, it's just that it's our child's birthday, right? You ever gone to a birthday party before and you see that little kid sitting in the corner just pouting away? You ever just kind of want to like walk up to them, just sneak up and be like, hey, hey kid, 
it's not your birthday, you little brat. <laughs> right, you ever do that and then just kind of slink back into the shadows? You ever wanted to do that? I don't, I'm a pastor. But I bet there's a lot of you who have wanted to do that before. Right, but here's the thing. I think some of us, as much as we have, some of us kind of need to be reminded of these things at Christmas. In fact, here's what I want you to do. Turn to the person that you're sitting next to and just say, hey, this Christmas, it's not your birthday. Go ahead, let them know straight away. I don't even care if you know them. Just look at them and say, hey, it's not your birthday, right? Right now, let's be honest, because we're all, we've been in church. There's always that one person who's like, but actually it is my birthday. I was born on the 20th. Right? Can we just take a moment of silence for everyone born in the month of December? You have been overlooked your entire life and it will never change. And we get it. We're sorry, right? We understand that, right? But this is what it reminds us. It's not our birthday, and so here's what we're going to do. For these next couple of minutes, what I want us to do today is I want us to take a look at, at the scriptural and the historical reason why we use gifts at Christmas. And last week or a couple of weeks ago when Dave spoke, he read out of Matthew chapter 2. It's become kind of the go-to passage when we start to read about the Christmas story. And so I'm going to read from part of that again. And I know you've probably heard this story. Even if you're new to church, at some point you've gone to a pageant or somewhere and you've heard these kind of stories being shared. And so you may have this tendency to kind of go, hey, listen, I already know the story. I heard it a couple of weeks ago. I heard it for the last 10 years in a row. Like, I get it. All right. And so here's my prayer for us. My prayer is that we have a fresh perspective. Right, that we actually get a look at the scriptural and historical record of Jesus. And, and here's what I bet for some of us. I bet when you see how the Bible explains the Christmas story, it may be a little bit different than what you've come to believe and what you've come to understand. Now, and Matthew chapter 2 is where this is at. And, and here's what it says. I'm going to kind of read this and we'll kind of unpack this as we go. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, after, everybody say after. Yeah. After. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Everybody say, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. All right, now here, you may know this, but if you don't, let me just explain it. Magi were a group of people who studied magic. They studied dark mysteries and arts. They were astrologers. They were some of the most studied and educated people in the world, which is why we call them the wise men. Right, but they were actually this group of people who spent their entire life studying the stars, reading the prophecies of different cultures and different religions. They were always on this quest to get to know more and to learn more. And so they studied the stars, they studied magic and all these kinds of dark arts. And here's what we know. We don't actually see how many magi came to visit Jesus. What we know is that magi came and they brought three gifts which is why we always say the three wise men, right? But that's not actually even what the scripture says. And here's what I want us to understand, all right? When we talk about the wise men, we think of the nativity scenes that we set out in our yards, right? We think of the books that we've been read our entire lives. And we picture these shepherds that are standing there and these wise men come from afar and they're sitting in a manger and they're looking at Jesus. But the scriptural record, the historical record of Jesus is actually a little bit different. These guys were the least likely of people to actually ever go and pursue the Messiah. They weren't interested in having their life changed. They weren't interested in saying, we want to follow after God. We want to grow in our relationship with God. They were just astrologers. They were studying the stars and they'd read the prophecies and there was something in them that was being drawn to something bigger than themselves. And so these guys were the least likely of people to ever go pursue the Messiah. But here's what I want you to notice. God was still pursuing them. And so they show up in Jerusalem and they start asking around, saying, hey, have you heard about this star that's rising? About this new king that's going to be born, that's going to be the savior of the world, or he's going to build this new kingdom here on earth? And word starts to spread as they talk about these prophecies, as they talk about these stars. And King Herod at the time begins to hear that there's some guys from out of town that came looking for the new coming king. And so here's what it says in verse seven. It says, then Herod called the Magi secretly and he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And so he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, I want you to go and search carefully 
for the child. Everybody say child. There we go. Very good. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. Now, this is where you have to understand. King Herod is a liar, okay? The Bible doesn't come right out and say this, but you pick this up in the next couple of verses. King Herod had this really bad habit that anybody that would threaten his kingdom, anybody including his own sons that might overtake him as king, he had this really nasty habit of killing them. In fact, Caesar Augustus once said that it was better to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons. And so Herod had no desire to actually go and meet with Jesus so that he could go and worship him. He wanted to know so that he could eliminate him to make sure that there's no possible way this person is going to come and take over his kingdom. And so the wise men, they go and they went to find this child. Now you remember, they don't have Google Maps. They don't have social media. They're not able to track down where Jesus is. There wasn't like some gender reveal party that was all over TikTok. And they're like, oh, there's Jesus, let's go. They had no clue. And so it took them a while. In fact, most historians would say this journey of trying to go and find Jesus lasted for a couple of years. And here's why. In verse 11, it says that when they arrive at the house, not a manger, they saw the child, not a baby. All right, so here you go. The wise men arrived after Jesus was born. They showed up to a house, not a manger, and they met a child, not a baby. Is that different than some of the nativity scenes we set out in our yard? Right, the books that we've read, right? So if you have any of those, just go burn them, right? And be like, I'm not, lies, mother, lies, right? Right? This is the scriptural and the historical evidence of what took place in Jesus' birth. It says, when the wise men show up, and this is what began to take place. And here's what I want you to notice. There's something that really fascinates me about the story of Jesus' birth. It says, when the wise men showed up, look what it says in verse 11. Here's what they did. They bowed down and they worshiped him. Now think about that. Isn't that a bit odd? Have you ever met a toddler you wanted to worship? ever. They're the worst, right? There's no way, but there's something in them. They were on this unlikely path, but there's something that happened as they go along this journey and they come and they meet Jesus for the first time. They didn't even know what fully to make of it, but they knew there was something in their heart that was being drawn, that this was a moment, that this person was significant and special. And it was starting to pull something out of their heart that has been placed in the DNA of every human from the very beginning of creation. There was this understanding that maybe there's more to life than I understand. Maybe there's more to life than I fully realize. Don't miss this. The wisest men in the world recognized something special was going on. They'd been told of the prophecies. They'd seen the stars that were rising. And they didn't know fully what to make of it, but but when they met Jesus, they did more than just believe. They fell and they worshiped him. And, and, And when you worship something and you worship someone, you bring them something of worth. And so this is what the wise men did. Here's what they brought. They opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. These were three of the most expensive and most extravagant gifts that you could give a person in this day and age. And it's in this one verse that we get the idea of giving gifts at Christmas. Right, but don't miss this. Who got all the gifts? Jesus. Listen, he's always the right answer when a pastor asks a question, right? It doesn't even really matter. You're like, what time service start? Jesus. All right, yeah, you're right. He does start whenever he's here in our hearts, right? Right. Who got all the gifts? Jesus, right? Now, why would that be the case? I'll tell you why. It's not your birthday, right? That's why. It's not your birthday, right? Stick with me for a minute because I'm not saying I want you to go home, gather all of your kids together and say, hey, listen, we had this really good looking pastor at at church and he said, we're not giving gifts to each other anymore. Only Jesus from here on out, right? I don't want them to hate me or God or the church, all right? But listen, here's, here's the thing. I want us to be honest about this because here's the challenging part for a lot of us, especially if we're being honest when it comes to Christmas. If gifts are the center of your Christmas, 
Jesus never will be. If gifts are the center of your Christmas, Jesus never will be. Why? It's not your birthday. It's not your birthday. You see, the beauty of the Advent season, having a set time, an opportunity for us to just slow down, refocus, recenter our hearts on the real meaning of Christmas is this reminder that it's not about you. It's not about the gifts. It's not about the parties. It's not about all the other things that we tend to make Christmas about. And see, what I love about Advent is it reminds us of all the simple mundane things that we take for granted in the Christmas season. Christmas lights and trees and angels and candy canes and even gifts. They were actually all created and designed to point you back to remembering the real meaning and purpose of Christmas. And in order for this to happen, we have to kind of evaluate our own rhythms and our own habits. There's this shift that has to take place in the way that we begin to think and the way we start to prioritize some things in our heart because without even realizing it, we can all kind of drift into making life and we can all kind of drift into making Christmas about us. Right? And think about it. Well, what's the number one question that we ask people, especially our kids or other kids that we meet during the Christmas time? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas, right? When you gather together as family and you sit down and you have your own private family and you're, you're able to have your own Christmas and you get all the extended family together and you're, you're sitting across the table from the cousin that you only saw last Christmas and you're like, I don't even know what to talk about. I'm not even sure if I know your name. So what do we say? What'd you get for Christmas? Right? Oh, did you get all the things that you hoped for, right? Without even realizing it, we can intentionally kind of make things about us. And listen, this isn't a bad question, right? Because giving gifts at Christmas, it's beautiful, it's a fun, it's a great expression of love. But here's what I want to suggest. I want to suggest that you ask a different question this Christmas. And I know this is going to sound cheesy, believe me. But rather than asking what did you get for Christmas or what do you want for Christmas, I think this one question could refocus and reprioritize your heart in tremendous ways, not just in the month of December, but from every day of every month for the rest of your life. What if this Christmas you began to ask the question, Jesus, what do you want for Christmas? It's not about me. So Jesus, what is it? What do you want for Christmas? I think that one question can reshape your focus for Christmas and center it on Jesus. Jesus, what do you want for Christmas? Now you maybe go, well, how are we going to ask that question, right? It's not like Jesus has got an Amazon wish list that we can kind of download and be like, <laughs> done, got it, Jesus. But here's the thing. If you were to actually read in the New Testament about the life, the birth, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, you'll actually see really clearly that there's a few things that Jesus says over and over. Hey, you want to know what I really want from you? It's this. If you read about Jesus's life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all throughout the recording of his life in the Gospels, you will see Jesus give this answer. It's almost like if you were sitting there at Christmas going, well, what gift could I bring? What, what do you want this Christmas? Jesus, here, here's what I tell you. In fact, if you're taking notes, you, you can write this one down. Here's what Jesus would tell us. The first one is this. Live intentionally for something beyond you. Live intentionally for something beyond you. If you follow the life of Jesus, and you listen to the teachings and the message of Jesus, everything Jesus is trying to pull out of your heart is this reminder that there is more to life than what you're settling for. That there is something bigger in this world. There's something bigger in purpose of creation. And Jesus over and over would say, here's what it is. I, I want you to believe in something more. See, that's what was drawing the wise men to travel over 600 miles through all kinds of terrain to take a two-year journey to meet a child. It's because something hardwired into their DNA was reminding them that there is something beyond themselves. And it set them on this course and this journey. The most unlikely of people to encounter the most unlikely Messiah. And here's the thing, when they met Jesus, they didn't just simply believe in the prophecies. They worshiped him. 
They surrendered their life and they worshiped him. And let me just say, there is a difference between believing in God and surrendering your life in worship to him. There is a difference between believing that there is a God or that there is a son of God named Jesus who came into this earth and surrendering your life and worship. In fact, I would go so far as to say if, if what you believe about God doesn't change the way that you live, you haven't yet to meet the real Jesus. Because this is something that began to take place. When the Magi met Jesus, they didn't just believe. They bowed and they worshiped him. And this is why the Apostle Paul, all throughout the New Testament, would encourage people who are followers of Christ to say, hey, listen, God wants more than just your gifts. He wants your life. He would tell them in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, listen, I want you to offer your bodies, right, your life, your well-being as a sacrifice. Right? That is the gift. I want you to offer your whole life as a sacrifice. That is your true and proper act of worship. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, there's something that begins to happen because when you meet the real Jesus, it changes the way you live. It's not just something you tuck in the back of your head going, yeah, that's a great story. I hear it every Christmas. It actually changes the decisions you make. It changes the priorities in your life. It changes how you spend your money, how you schedule your time, how you raise your children, how you treat your wife, how you work during the day. It changes it all. And this is what Jesus was saying over and over throughout his message. And I promise you, it's one of those things that if, if you were sitting down trying to say, hey, Jesus, what do you want from me for Christmas? One of the number one things he would say is, I want your life. I want you to live for something beyond yourself. I want you to realize that you're actually a part of a bigger story. And what you choose in this life actually matters. Jesus would say, here's what I want. I want you to live intentionally beyond yourself. Or as you read the, the life of Jesus, you, you'd see real clearly there's another thing that kind of jumps to the top of his wish list. And, and it says, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Jesus say, Here, here's what I want. I, I want you to live intentionally for something beyond yourself, but I want you to give generously to something beyond yourself. Right? And here's what I mean. I think it's nearly impossible to read the gospel accounts of Jesus and not come to the conclusion that Jesus loves when we give generously beyond ourselves, right? Not just in our finances, but in our time, in our schedule, in our emotions, in our ability to be present with those that we love. Jesus loves when we stop making life about us. And we start to look at everything we say and do and the things that we can bring to the table to help make a difference this side of heaven through a completely different perspective. Jesus loves those things. And as you look through the whole New Testament, you see this over and over and over again. Verse after verse in the Bible shows us God's heart and desire for us to walk in generosity. I'll show you. I'll read a couple of these verses to you right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. But look what he says, through your generosity, it will result in thanksgiving to God. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, I'm gonna do some things in your heart and in your life. I'm gonna do some blessings in your life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show generosity to you. And when you start to show that generosity to other people, there's something in them that goes, oh, wow, that's really awesome. No one's ever been that kind to me before. No, no one ever took time to sit down and to have a conversation with me before. No one ever helped me in that kind of a way. No one ever offered to buy my coffee. No one ever paid for our groceries. No one ever helped me in that kind of a way. And all of a sudden, something in their heart is reminded that they're a part of something bigger. And the Bible says it kind of points their hearts to God. Right? Here's another one. In Psalm chapter 112, it says, Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Luke chapter six says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'll give you a generosity martini, <laughs> right? You start being generous with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shake things up a little bit. I'm going to stir it around. I'm going to pour over generosity in your heart and your life. And I'm going to give you things that you didn't even know were possible, right? That's how much Jesus believes in this. He says, for the measure you use, it will be measured to you, All right? Here's what it is. Generosity is fueled when you start to come to grips that God has been generous to you. 
That's how it's fueled in our hearts and our life. When I start to come to the realization that God has been really gracious to me, even when I didn't deserve it, it makes me want to be gracious to others. When I start to come to the realization that God has forgiven me, even when I don't feel like I should have been deserved, it makes me want to be more forgiving to others. When, when I start to realize that God has blessed me, and, and, and let's be honest, God blesses us in spite of us sometimes. When I start to realize that God has done that, it causes me to want to be a blessing to others. Right? Generosity is fueled in your heart and mind when we just come to grips that there is a God who has been completely generous to you. And so when that happens, man, I look at things differently. I look at how I spend my money differently. I look at what I invest in, and there's no greater return on your investment than when you invest in the things of God. I look at the way I treat people completely different because of God's generosity to me. And I think generosity is at the core of the Christian life and our experience with God. And I think it's one of those things that Jesus would say, hey, you want to give me something this Christmas? Be generous. That's what I want for you. I want this for you because I have something, not from you that I want, but something for you that I want. But, but here's the thing, without a doubt, if you were to look through the life and the teaching and the purpose of Jesus, I think the number one gift that Jesus would want for Christmas from you this year is your heart. He wants your whole heart. He wants the broken pieces, the prideful pieces. He wants those pieces that you've tucked away to make sure that no one ever gets a hold of again. He wants all of it. Because your heart is God's most prized possession. And God doesn't just want your Sunday or your Wednesday parts. He wants all of it. In fact, Jesus said, hey, this is, this is my greatest wish this Christmas. This is what I would want above anything else for your life. He said it this way. He called it the greatest commandment. Here's what I'd want from you. I, I want you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. You see, your heart is where living intentionally and giving graciously actually begins. And your heart has always been the focus of Jesus. That was the entire story of Christmas. That's the purpose why Jesus came. It's what stirred all of those people to go, I gotta go on this journey. I gotta figure this out. Every situation, every circumstance of your entire life has been leading you to this encounter with Jesus. And I bet in a room our size with as many people that are watching, as many of us who have experienced life with God, there's a lot of us that can remember those very, those very first few moments where we encountered Christ. And all of a sudden, we shifted from just believing in God to now surrendering our life to worshiping God. And it changed our lives forever. How we live is different. How we chase things in life is different. And maybe there's some of you that are here, and you don't know, you can't remember that moment. When all of a sudden you went from knowing about God to now living and experiencing God for your life. And before we're done today, I want to give you an opportunity to meet that Jesus. But this is the story of Christmas. It's the purpose for why Jesus came. And Jesus says, Here, here's the thing. You want to know what the greatest gift you could bring? It's your heart. Give me your heart. That's, that's what I really want this Christmas. Then I want you to live generously. I want you to live intentionally. Remember that you're a part of a bigger story. These are all the things that Jesus offers and what he brings to us when it comes to the story of Christmas. Your heart has always been God's most prized possession. That's who God is chasing after. Hope, purpose, passion, second chances, it all awaits those who take God's son. God's most desperate attempt to tap you on the shoulder and to get your attention is found in the story of Christmas. To let you know that your life is a part of something bigger, that you were created for something more than you've settled for. And so as you enter in this Christmas season, my prayer for you is that you get reminded once again of the reason for the season. And if you've never prayed a prayer to choose the Son, 
that you would make that your prayer and say, Jesus, here, here's what I'll bring you this Christmas. I'll give you my whole heart. And I'm going to choose to live my life intentionally for something beyond myself. I'm going to give generous of my time, my talent, my treasure, my life. God, you get it all for something beyond myself. That's the story of Christmas. That's the reason Jesus came. Your heart is his most prized possession. And it's the best gift that you could ever bring. See, Christmas isn't about presents, but it is about a gift. The gift of Jesus that comes to rescue all of us. Can I pray with us tonight? God, thank you for who you are. Thanks for what you're doing. I pray that we would be reminded of your goodness and your grace for us. That this Christmas we would continue to lean in and remember the real reason for the season. That that's the Father's heart for us. Over and over and over again. And so God, we bring you our life. We bring you our heart. And we thank you for the gift of Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.